Hello, and good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Rob Piquet, and on behalf of my co-contributors, Igor Sklyar and Will Earl, I'd like to welcome you to a journey through NBC's adoption of physically-based shading over the last 20 years. I was a principal architect at NBC Film, and I'll provide some background and context as I quickly cover over the years leading up to 2015. Igor, NBC Film's senior shader writer, will talk in depth about the work we've done in recent years on hair shading. Finally, Will, NBC Film's Head of Optimization, will close with a commentary on where things stand today and where we see further challenges and exciting opportunities for the future. Where did it all begin for us? If you want to know when we adopted a certain advance in rendering, look at the RenderMan release notes until that feature is mentioned, and you'll probably be within a few months. We have a track record of being very aggressive in our adoption of new releases of RenderMan, generally more so than with other third-party software packages we use. It's not uncommon for us to throw beta versions into production. I also really want to highlight this slide to be upfront about the bias, no rendering pun intended. Some of what we say today may be universal, some things might be more RenderMan specific, and many may just be the wonky and wonderful way that we work at NBC. My memory of the past is probably more romantic than the reality of it, but it was for the most part a simpler time. Shaders were generally pretty short, not very complicated to write. We cheated everything like crazy and there was little to no physical motivation behind our shading models at the time. It was driven very heavily by artistic intent, and I don't mean to say that's necessarily a bad thing unto itself, but it did have consequences. Irrespective of the shading models, the traditional multi-pass approach to rendering meant we ended up generating a lot of byproducts. Let's pretend this is one of the iconic battle shots from NBC's work on Troy. Shadows are pretty critical in selling that the Trojan soldiers are actually standing on the ground, and it's all done using depth maps. Rendering the world from the viewpoint of the light, and recording the distance between the light and the geometry of the scene. Now if we focus on just the soldiers, we can see there's pretty sparse coverage of the frame, and this led to the custom development of tools that would look at the soldiers one by one, and figure out their screen space coverage, so we can capture them individually. Now this is awesome, because each map is now quite tight and efficient, and we can theoretically reuse a lot of data, if a later iteration of the render only requires an animation update to a single soldier. But it's not so awesome because one shadow map has suddenly turned into 10, or 100, or 1000. And tracking the correspondence between shadow maps and animation changes, or lack thereof, it's a significant challenge. In the early 2000s, MPC was already using image-based lighting to help our CG content integrate more naturally into the filmed content. We wrote tools which would decompose light probes into a series of directional lights via median cut and similar algorithms. So now we've got dozens of lights per shot, each of which may have dozens of shadow maps. And ultimately this transformed the role of a lighter into a data wrangler, needing to manage thousands of shadow passes per frame. In short, a data management nightmare. But at least the images look prettier. Now further complicating the life of our lighters were the bespoke surface shaders, with little to no grounding in real world physics. This meant they needed to invest heavily in shot specific look dev, to ensure not only that individual assets felt believable in isolation, but also in relation to neighboring assets. A tree that looked beautiful in one shot might appear to be glowing in a different shot, and similarly a character standing beside the tree might be getting darker at the same time the tree was getting lighter. Our road to salvation started 15 years ago, when we got our first taste of ray tracing. It also let us start dabbling with ray traced shadows and reflections, although in honesty for many years we still found ourselves just using a lot of shadow maps for assorted artistic control and performance reasons and just being the devil we already knew. The most fundamental shift in our approach to rendering came in the form of the physically based shading movement around 2010, maybe a few years earlier. In preparation for this presentation, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how best to summarize the impact. And one thing I kept coming back to is that it made us more disciplined and able to reason about our materials and shading. We started to think more about the area of lights, about energy, really about representing the physical quantities of the real world. And in theory, this should make the lives of our artists simpler. So one of our first efforts was to pursue materials which were energy conserving, and introduced surface shading based off of the work by Schickman and Shirley, complemented by Albedo Pump Up, based off of work by Newman. This was complemented by an in-house framework for important sampled materials, where the number of reflection and occlusion rays was driven by the surface roughness, for example. We first used this on 2010's Clash of the Titans, and talked about it that year in an important sampling course at SIGGRAPH. I'd encourage you to read the notes from that course if you're interested, and I'm not going to spend more time on it here. Not long after we started our efforts on PBS, Pixar released their own framework for physically plausible shaders in RenderMan, 
and we transitioned to use it. This continued our trend to embrace ray tracing and started a movement away from bespoke materials and towards more general purpose ones. Now, of course, nothing good comes for free. Reality is rather complicated, and that complexity ends up manifesting itself in many places, such as in our shader code. Our main production shader at this time went up to about 4,000 lines of code just for the surface light interaction. All the pattern generation code was in separate code shaders. And we ended up trading one data management problem for another. RenderMan still wasn't really designed at the lowest level to be the world's simplest or fastest ray tracer at the time. So we had to find ways to get the benefits of indirect illumination without brute force tracing a bajillion rays. So we'd render direct illumination passes, bake that illumination out in point clouds, convert those into brick maps, and then render again, tracing secondary rays against these caches for the bounce lighting. And the result is pretty darn good, especially if we compare this image against the previous one. But we still have a multi-pass render with point cloud and brick map artifacts along the way. Now, roughly five years ago, we had another major paradigm shift in our rendering, as Pixar added the RAS framework into RenderMan. We buried our shadow maps and point clouds and brick maps deep in the ground and embraced the world of single-pass path tracing. Now, this also meant throwing away our entire shading library and, for better or worse, starting again from scratch. Initially, we started by building a fairly small but distinct set of BXDFs for different material types. We had separate plugins for general hard surfaces, cloth, glass, hair, particles, volumes, and eyes, that which I left off this slide because Honestly, a photorealistic eyeball, it's a bit gross to look at. Now, these plugins were a combination of custom code and work from the RenderMan team. Now, over time, we decided to consolidate our materials. For example, pulling cloth and glass into our general hard surface shader. And this increased the complexity of the remaining BXDFs, but it made it easier to think about material layering and blending, a topic we'll talk about later. While our general trend recently has been to move towards vendor-provided materials, for example, our use of RenderMan's Pixar Surface, the glaring exception has been our continued investment in custom hair shading. And for that, I'll hand over to Eager. One of the very first films we rendered using this was Disney's 2016 movie, The Jungle Book. We delivered this project using a custom hair shader based on the popular Marshner model. Although it was largely successful, but had a number of limitations which we would like to improve. Thankfully, a new huge show was coming, and it was a request from production to further improve our fur and hair shading. For Disney's The Lion King, we needed something that would make the show distinctive in terms of the fur look. The progress in shading had to be noticeable. The close-up performances meant our curves could no longer look like reborn. And the pale lion fur meant we needed to properly investigate the physical properties of hair and color attenuation. There has been lots of great research into fur rendering in the last decade, especially in the last five-ish years. Initially, we were also very much inspired by the work, a practical and controllable hair and fur model for production path tracing from Disney, explained in the 2016 paper. So we diverged on many aspects of Disney, Disney's work, and we were mostly focused on the physical accurate fur re reflectance, modeling, measurement, and rendering, 2015 paper and an efficient and practical NEA and FAR film model 2017 papers from Jan, as this series of papers give a deeper explanation of how FUR works and what kind of parameterization should be implemented. Ensuring that our curves had a cylindrical rather than a flat look became one of the main requests. The coming show is supposed to have a lot of close-ups where we would see individual strands of fur and hair. Longitudinal and azimuthal roughness became a default request to the new shader too, and supposed to control all the lobes with no extra roughness value for each lobe. All the properties of consequent lobe were computed automatically and had to be physically plausible. Another goal was to make the controls as minimum and easy to use as possible, but this couldn't extend to the point where our artist's creativity was hampered as we had to be able to achieve the look of all possible species of animals. Natural light scattering and the proper color parameterization was requested as was requested as well. Using the diffuse lobe as the main lobe to set the color of the groom was not acceptable anymore. The color had to be accumulated due to the multiple bounces across the groom. All the lobes supposed to be well balanced in terms of energy conservation, and of course the performance of the shader had to be as good or better than what we had before. 
As mentioned, we had started our prototype based on PBRT supplementary chapter and some of the aspects from Disney 2016 work. But we started to get deeper into the subject of fur and began analyzing what we could improve in terms of physical parameterization to get even more realism. We started by looking deeper into the study of fur structure and how fur is physically composed. This series of images contrasts human hair against the fur of animals. The two left images show the internal structure and cuticle layer for human hair. The four right images highlight the medulla and cuticle layer of animal fur fibers. Hair and fur share some common structures. They are often cylindrical with some eccentricity, and in both cases there are three main structural layers. The cuticle, which covers fibers within clean scales, the cortex, which contains nearly all the colored pigments within the fiber, and the medulla, which lies in the center of the fiber with complex internal structure that scatters light. There are also some notable differences. I will draw your attention to both the inner medulla core, which is quite significant in fur but very small in human hair, and the outer cuticle layer, which has more complex structural details in fur fibers. We decided to get as close as it possible to the parameterization described by Jan in his 2015-2017 papers and parameterize our medulla as a volume based on absorption, scattering coefficients, and the phase function. We wanted to be able to understand in numbers how fur behaves for different species of animals. The table is supposed to be a starting point for look depth to further tune. Our custom fur shader went through two major iterations, which you will see in a few slides. While they both considered the structure of fur to be based on the previously mentioned components like cuticle, cortex, medulla, one of the major differences between them was the parameterization of the medulla. At the beginning for our first iteration, which we call FU1, we made an assumption about medulla based on a schema proposed by Jan in his 2015 paper. We decided to add two extra lobes, TTS and TRTS, which had a wider angle of sampling. This allowed us to control the scattering all of the groom and make look more diffusive when it's needed. Here we can see the different lobes we got from FUR1, but the medulla contribution to the final look was weighted by an extra parameter, something like medulla intensity, which had a non-physical meaning compared to what we really wanted, which was a medulla radius. And this led us to FUR2, which you can see in the image on the right. As mentioned, we wanted to control medulla contribution, not as a weight of medulla loss, but literally controlling the size or radius of the medulla as that would give us much more core color attenuation. For this goal, we wanted our shader to emulate a second cylinder simulating the medulla core inside the cortex which acting as scattering medium with actual radius. This is known as double cylinder model and was suggested by Jan in his 2015 paper. We also wanted to control the light scattering by specifying it as forward, isotropic or backward when it's needed. Ultimately, the goal was to get closer to the parameterization provided in the Jan 2017 paper. Linking both cylinders back to the first structure, the outer cylinder can vary with a cuticle layer parameter, adjusting the ratio between the reflected and refracted light. The inner cylinder represents the medulla. It doesn't absorb light significantly, but scatter light when light travels inside. And between these two cylinders is the cortex, which simply absorbs the light. During the development of our shader, it was important to match the shading to a real geometric ground truth. On the left is real mesh geometry with a glass shader assigned to it. There are actually two nested geometries, the inner one representing the medulla. On the right is the curve with our custom shader applied. Hopefully you agree that the look matches pretty closely. Inside the red box, we discard the outer shell and only visualize the inner medulla to represent the similarity of real refracted geometry and analytically built second cylinder. Being able to control the medulla radius gave us the ability to change the look quite dramatically. Here you can see the impact of increasing the radius from left to right, again highlighting just the medulla in the red box. On the left we have a very narrow medulla, on the right the medulla takes up almost the entire curve. According to Jan 2015-2017 research papers, medulla behaves very much like a volumetric medium. Let's consider the radiative transport equation, which represents the distribution of radiance in volumes and try to understand which parts of it could be considered for medulla simulation. We got rid of emission and merged together absorption and outer scattering into the extinction coefficient. 
Now let's represent this in the volumetric rendering equation form. Here we have two important components. The first exponential member of the integral is transmittance, which is responsible for light attenuation and includes both absorption and scattering coefficients, called also extinction factor. And the second member, which includes phase function, is scattering. Looking at this diagram, we have to apply a transmittance formula for each part of the path, for each lobe, keeping in mind that cortex and medulla has different absorption coefficients and cortex doesn't scatter the light, mostly behaving like a glass. Medulla behaves like a volume. That means that the radius of medulla and its absorption coefficient, as well as the line width of curve, affect the final color. And if absorption coefficient is something that is based on the input color and then converted in, into absorption coefficients for both cortex and medulla as the initial values in scattering components is quite tricky to simulate. Although scattering is happening on the particles level and phase function is the angular distribution of light intensity scattered by a particle at a given wavelength due to the particle wave duality of the light, we decided to generalize heine grinstein phase function to the scale of curve and don't take into consideration multiple scattering inside the medulla. That kind of approximation became the main idea in our medulla shading. So here you can see how the phase function affects the look of the curve. The value changes from 0 to 1, from left to right. For fewer medulla, the phase function is positive, so the scattering is either isotropic or has a forward direction. Here we similarly demonstrate how the medulla's phase function affects bunches of, of hair. As G increases, more light goes straight through. Although there is no scattering on the particle level, there is still a scattering on the broader groom level between fibers, which we can control using phase function. Here you can see how look changes when we change the local scattering of the medulla, from pure scattering behavior left to pure diffuse right. Because the width as well as the density of the groom affects the final result a lot, we have absorption scaling for both cortex and medulla, as well as global width scaling which affects overall groom. Curve thickness and overall fur density affect the transmittance and scattering and by extension the final color. Our artists may want to decouple the geometry and shading, controlling each individually, and so we exposed a curve width parameter in the shader itself. The image here demonstrates from left to right the effect of emulating increasing width via shader. You can see shifts in color, saturation, and brightness. In our new shader, color is no longer picked up by diffuse reflection, but rather accumulates as the result of scattering events within the medulla inside the fur. In short, it's gone from surface effect to a volumetric one. The color we achieve comes from absorption in cortex and scattering in the medulla across the multiple bounces. Specifically, we get color in real hair because of the presence of the substance called melanin, mostly in the cortex layer. Eomelanin causes hair to be brown-black. Theomelanin causes hair to be red. Rather than letting artists pick random colors for sure, we provided them with a swatch like this, which let them specify a color appropriate to an actual melanin concentration value. But that brings us back to this single strand vs. furball comparison and the obviously different appearance of each. Other artists knew what color they wanted the final result to look like, but given that it resulted from complex volumetric scattering in a multiple bounce lighting situation, it wasn't obvious how all the equations should be seeded. We are not the first to observe this. The 2016 paper by Disney basically describes the same thing. The artists at Disney wanted to match the color of fur to the surface color of spheres by specifying a common input color shown in the third row. The team worked out the math that internally would generate the colors in the fourth row, which when used to drive the fur shader, and the result of this, visually desired color of a groom. The number of light bounces affects the final color too. In this image, we have 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 bounces from left to right. Not only does the fur get brighter in the right images, it also gets more reddish-orange. In the end, we rendered the bulk of the show, including The Lion King, with 8 to 10 bounces of, the light, of light and calibrated our fur shader accordingly. We were really concerned about performance and energy conservation. We utilized a multiple important sampling technique as well as important sampling based on each lobe's contribution. And the performance in general was 15-30% better than a similar look with Pixar Marshner, depending on shading parameterization and lighting environment.
A huge amount of attention was paid to energy conservation during the development of our shader. This was one of, if not the most important improvements we made, ensuring that the sum of all the loads was normalized and well balanced. On the left, there is a curve which matches a wide background almost perfectly. Just to the right of it is the same curve, but isolated against the black background. And on the right is a fury sphere ball, where tips of the curve perfectly matches to the background and some occlusion happens towards, towards the roots. This is the typical furnace test and shows we are not getting any inappropriate glowing or darkening. As a result, we've got an ability to render wide fur without any difficulty. Our look dev team were really excited about this for another show we were working on at the same time. Achieving this effect was quite hard before using Marshner model, where the color was set by diffuse lobe. Overall, we have seven fiber lobes, which allow us to render fur physically correct and in energy conserving manner. We output them to, to AOVs using light path expressions. Besides that, diffuse lobe was introduced atop of this to simulate dust and dirt, extra specular lobe to, sim to simulate wetness, and extra input for iridescence to render feathers. Here is the full evolution of our full shaders over the last five years. On the left is the flat ribbon-like curved shader that we used on the jungle book. In the middle is our full one shader that we used on the Lion King with nice cylindrical look. Finally, on the right is our full two shader that has recently been rolled out into production, complete with the medulla scattering core. And I will close by showing the same comparison in a slightly more interesting context than a single first strand. Again, the leftmost image is using flat ribbon curve. The second image is for one. The third image is for two. And the rightmost image is for two with textured albedo. And that takes us to where we are today. Allowing look dev artists to work with ad hoc shading networks gave us the ability to do really interesting things with the look development. It also meant that we were often reinventing the wheel on every show, even for commonly used materials such as skin, cloth, and hair. It also led to inconsistencies when having to incorporate that work into final lighting. This is illustrated above, where the motorcycle on the right is supposed to look like the one on the left. Using the tools available to them, lighters would often make shading and lighting adjustments within their scene to compensate. Here I've used light linking, along with various adjustments to the hue, saturation, and even the specular contribution of the light in order to get a closer match on the two motorcycles. You can see the impact of these lighting adjustments in the reference spheres. Over the last few years we've built up an all-encompassing uber shader we've referred to internally as the asset shader. Originally inspired by Disney's principal shading work, we set out to create a general purpose material which could handle 9 out of 10 of our look dev needs. While the foundation for this Uber shader is a shading network, the user experience is presented within Katana as a hierarchy of parameters, utilizing all the available lobes within Pixar Surface and offering several layers of overrides from which to drive the appearance of multi-layered materials. We additionally incorporated material presets, building up a series of parent and child materials from which we could automatically apply LookDev and get production-ready results quickly. This automatic system relied on two inputs being well-defined prior to the LookDev stage. First, the tagging of objects with a material type, and the second being appropriately painted texture maps for that material. For example, in order to reveal a metal layer under a painted layer, the material would look for a predefined texture map used to mask the painted layer. The use of the asset shader and its presets helped unify a lot of our look dev and lighting scenes, but its complexity and associated compute costs became problematic. While the user interface could be simplified with conditional widgets that could hide shading parameters that were not being used, we still ended up with a large number of parameters for even relatively simple single layered materials. Further concern was that large portions of the shading network itself were always being evaluated even in these simple materials. Attempts to optimise the logic of the shading network didn't result in significant improvements, and in production cases where the compute cost became problematic, we optimised materials with scripted operations that disconnected sections of the shading network, or replaced the troublesome shaders with heavily simplified versions of those materials. One of the main problems with version 1 of the asset shader was its top-down approach to building the shader. The following screenshot showing the node graph used to create the material presets. The nodes highlighted in yellow contain the shading networks that make up the foundation of the asset shader. Version 2 was designed to address this, to build the shader from the ground up in a more dynamic and procedural way, while still maintaining a consistent structure and user interface when it came to layered materials. Within Katana we developed a super tool, seen along the top, that would allow a look dev artist to dynamically build materials, creating both the shading network and the parameter interface for the artist the user never directly interacting with the shading network itself. This now allows LookDev artists to create individual shading layers as presets that can be combined together with masks. Here the layering operation is purely horizontal and utilizes a fixed vertical stack of lobes. 
Shaders can still inherit from parent shaders, allowing users to define child shaders which can add or subtract layers as needed, making it easy to add layered variants to existing materials. The resulting user interface also becoming a lot more straightforward and easy to manage, even when increasing the number of layers. This new system does allow artists to create larger number of layers than were previously allowed in the asset shader. In practice, we're hopeful that LookDev artists will want to work with fewer layers and that the overall number of shading nodes that make up an asset will go down. As we start rolling version 2 into productions, the render time comparisons we've done between version 1 and 2 have reduced by around 20%. In the best case examples, we've seen render times drop from around 6 hours to 2 hours, a two-thirds reduction in rendering cost. Looking ahead, we continue to push for more physically accurate, or at least physically motivated effects in our shading and rendering. We continue to have internal discussions about layered materials, especially where it concerns energy conservation and balancing light contribution among substrate layers. And although we've moved away from additional BXDF such as cloth, glass and particle, cloth is one area we are likely to revisit soon, especially as clothing becomes more realistically modelled as fibres rather than as textured subdivision surfaces. Lastly, with an increased confidence in our materials, we're taking an increased interest in how we describe the lights that illuminate our world and the cameras and sensors that consume this illumination. Over the last few years, we've worked on a few films which have required the exchange of assets between visual effects studios. While model and texture data is often straightforward and easy to deal with, the exchange of look dev data is often little more than visual references such as renders and movies from which to try and match the look. This can often be complex and time-consuming process to translate artistically. This translation is frustrating as the language of LookDev among studios and renderers is more akin to different regional dialects than it is a number of entirely different languages. The common building blocks for processing signals in LookDev have long been well established in shading languages such as OSL, where terms such as gamma, exposure and remap are the same wherever you go. Even when discussing BXDFs, where the differences in implementation are stronger, the language of diffuse, specular and subsurface is pretty common. The example shown is a translation of an Arnold scene on the left into a Renderman scene on the right. The end result is remarkably similar and gives us increased confidence that sharing of look dev will soon become as straightforward as sharing geometry and textures. This portability doesn't just influence external exchange. Often internally within the studio we have cases where doing the look dev early and being able to use it under multiple contexts has huge benefits. One of the major goals in our virtual production work is to get lighting and materials representation closer in approximation to the final frame, allowing filmmakers to make more upfront decisions about the work when filming. We are forming an opinion regarding technologies such as Material X and MDL, the above example illustrating MDL materials available within V-Ray on the left, and our work on an MDL implementation in RenderMan on the right. In the last year we've heavily discussed not just how physically based shading plays a part in our work, but also how lights, lenses and cameras play a part in the verisimilitude of our physically based rendering. Outside of a handful of rare situations, we've traditionally avoided rendering with lens effects such as distortion or depth of field, instead utilising compositing techniques to artistically reproduce the look and feel of a real lens. We were keen to explore what a more accurate lens model would give us over a thin lens model, and so earlier this year we implemented sparse, high degree polynomials for wide angle lenses as a projection plugin in RenderMan. In the image presented we see a render through a toy lens. While this nicely portrays the characteristics of that particular lens for realistic integration of CG elements into a live action plate, this may be a desirable use of a real lens, but less desirable if the creative intention is to capture the feeling of the lens rather than all its physical characteristics. The switch to physically based shading has meant over the years our lighting has become more spatially accurate to the geometry of live action sets and locations. However, all of our illumination values are still relative to the live action plates we use rather than absolute photometric units. Spectral rendering is also an area where we can see obvious benefits and improvements to our shading and rendering. Particularly in the case of digital humans, where even subtle improvements in shading can dramatically increase the realism and our emotional connection to the resulting image. While we've yet to cross that threshold, the arguments for pursuing more physically based illumination and spectral precision in production rendering are gradually becoming stronger. This work is always a team effort. Special thanks to the following people for their contributions to the world of physically based shading at MPC Film in the last year, and all of those who have contributed to look dev and shading at MPC Film in years prior. And thanks to you for your attention. It's always wonderful for us to have the opportunity to share a bit of history and magic that goes into MPC's movie making process. And I hope you've enjoyed the story. From us all, good morning, afternoon, evening or night. Keep safe.